AI or artificial intelligence is just, it, it's coming into its own right now. I can't say enough about this. And you know what? I'm going to do a little webinar. We'll have a call with everybody to show you exactly what it's all about. Well, obviously, I'm not going to do a demo here, webinar here. This is this is the radio, right? You're watching this. You're listening to this on a podcast, perhaps. But uh, it'll be my newsletter. I'll, I'll tell you more about that. Make sure you get the newsletter at craigpeterson.com. So, what are we talking about? AI is artificial intelligence. At least that's what it stands for. In reality, the AI that we have today is more of a machine learning and and it's very very clever a guy over at google you might remember got fired who was working on google's ai projects and was saying hey it, it is sentient it, it it's passed the turing test and of course the turing test was can the computer fool someone in another room into thinking it's a human. And of course, with some of these newer ones, you kind of can. Some of the grammar's poor, the answers are wrong. It kind of goes on and on. Uh, a friend of mine who actually writes books, kind of ghost writer, had a little webinar for his people where he showed them a little bit about what's happening with ChatGPT and some of the others out there. And I just kind of irked me okay this is i i'm admitting this but it kind of irked me because of the fact that you know i know this stuff what the heck is he doing who does he think he is in going and having a webinar about technology because he's a writer right he doesn't know much about technology so it, it i came to realize that the the problem i have with some of this stuff is what's called the curse of knowledge I have been following AI and ML for many decades now, and have been following the whole open AI stuff, the chat GPT, for a couple of years that they've been kind of cooking. And of course, now I'm involved in that preview. So if you want to mess with that preview release, by the way, just go to chat.openai.com. I'm going to try and go there right now. Let's just check to make sure I'm giving the right one. Chat openai.com okay here it is so it is letting me in it's letting me log in they have varying ability to take you on the best time to try and do it is kind of early morning when people aren't trying to use it but you will be impressed it is absolutely amazing and as i said in my newsletter this year and i have this week i should say and i have an article about it up on my website Man, you're going to see their influence absolutely everywhere this year. It is absolutely amazing. Microsoft has already put a billion dollars into ChatGPT. Is, is that amazing? A billion dollars. And on top of that, we've got another $10 billion investment coming from Microsoft. So you might ask yourself, why, why does Microsoft care? What's going on? Microsoft cares for a few reasons. One of them is they want to put this technology into Word so that you won't have to write a document hardly anymore. You'll put together a few ideas and then let the AI go off and do it. And I'm calling it an AI as opposed to artificial intelligence, because if you ask me, it's not really artificial intelligence. But let the AI go off and do it. And it does an absolutely amazing job when you get right down to it. I'm shocked. And I've done a couple of things before live on the air and uh, have kind of demonstrated what it can do. I, I was on with on one radio station uh, with a, a host and we were talking and, and I said, OK, so ask me a question, any question. And he asked a question about uh, I think it was ancient uh, it wasn't Greece. I think it, it, it must have been Italy because he's, you know, big time Italian guy. So 
Off I went. I typed it in live and up came the answer. So I'm on it right now. Chat GPT. Again, you can sign up chat.openai.com. I just asked. I said, got any creative ideas for 10 year old's birthday? So it's coming up right now. It's typing as we speak. It says, host a scavenger hunt with clues leading to a final prize. Have a DIY project party where each child decorates their own t-shirt or canvas bag. Plan a movie or game night with a theme like Harry Potter, Minecraft, or Star Wars. Organize a sports tournament with different stations for different sports. It goes on and on. I'm not going to read all of these to you. It gets kind of boring. But they're all really good suggestions. So how did it come up with those? How, how does this AI work? Well, AI works a little differently than you might think, right? It, it's not thinking. It's not being creative. This particular AI, the one from OpenAI, and it's being used for ChatGPT, was fed tons of stuff from the internet millions of different posts from things like reddit and obviously wikipedia and many others and they were all put together and it kind of learned from that it's fascinating how machine learning works but it's able to draw some conclusions and put it all together so it looks like you are talking to a person it really does. And what you're doing when you're interacting with it is really just going into a big database. Now, this is what I mentioned again, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. But if you look at the business model of Google, you'll understand why Google has declared a code red. Because Google, you go to Google, and of course this applies to Bing, it applies to DuckDuckGo and others, but you go to Google and you type in a question and it's going to give you a bunch of links to different content, which is kind of cool, right? Yeah, it works pretty well. It's just really kind of cool. I kind of like it. Uh, but those links are interspersed with ads, aren't they? Right at the very top, there's kind of some AI that has produced some short answers and, and it's got the little arrows pointing down so that you can pull up some more detailed information that thinks you might want. Think is, of course, the wrong word, but, you know, our language, our inability to express ourselves. But at the top, you've got an ad, one or more. On the right hand side, you've got ads interspersed as i mentioned you've got ads so what's going to happen when you don't have ad space anymore so right now i'm on a website you can go to you don't have to sign up for check it out it's called you.com y-o-u.com and i'm going to ask you.com this same question any creative ideas for 10 year old's birthday so let me type that in and we're going to hit return here it's going to do its search and ta-da it is showing me results just like google would some 10 year old birthday party ideas for kids on websites so a subtle revelry is one of them peerspace.com mom junction child fun that's kind of cool isn't it well how about if you want an AI generated answer? Well, you.com gives that to you for free as well. So on the right hand side of that results page on you.com, you.com, you'll see a, a little button that lets you see the results of an AI generated answer. Interesting, isn't it? So here are some creative ideas for 10 year old's birthday, according to you.com's AI. Have a themed party like Harry Potter or a superhero party. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Take a trip to local batting cages or laser tag arena. Have a spa day with manicures, pedicures, and facials. Yeah, 10 year olds are going to love that one, right? Uh, spend the day at a trampoline park or indoor playground. Have a movie night with popcorn and snacks, baking, cooking classes. So you, you see here, this is today's AI. Not so accurate, is it? Because you know a 10 year old, maybe a girl might be interested in this. I can't think of many boys that would, but you know, the spa day, manicures, pedicures, facials, the, they, it will get things wrong. 
it will <laughs> it'll misgender and when i say that i mean really it'll misgender uh stuff it will go ahead and make recommendations that aren't valid it'll say things that are homophobic or uh, otherwise completely unacceptable and it's beta so remember that when you're using it or trying to use it it's very cool it is fun to play with i've already found it very helpful when it comes to things like this getting ideas for articles getting some suggestions of you know what's the best way to handle this or the best way to handle that and you'll have that same ability but you can use some of that right now without signing up for anything by just going to you.com and they do have the ability to sign up on you.com if you wanted to and once you're there it gives you a little bit more experience and it learns more about you in much the same way google's been doing for a very long time learning about you and what you do and where you go and uh, what's going on online right all of that sort of stuff is available to you right there so check it out make sure you uh, have a look at some of these links that are in my newsletter this week that you'll find of course online craigpeterson.com slash subscribe i i'm just absolutely amazed at what is going on with chatbots and more oh and by the way <laughs> norton lifelock got hacked yeah norton lifelock got hacked so yeah your personal information was probably stolen from the people that are supposed to help you recover it right we've got 16 major car brands now where vehicles are at risk yeah they're they're trying to make things a little easier for software developers and at the same time they're making them easier for hackers and thieves Hey, before we get into the cars, I want to bring up this Norton LifeLock thing. This happens all of the time. You you might remember Experian got hacked, and then they just kind of kind of got hacked again. There's some details we'd have to get into to really explain it, but it just keeps happening. These companies just don't care enough to get the right kind of security in place and if you ask me that's a problem so now we have our friends at norton lifelock warning that hackers breached norton lifelock password manager accounts now how many times have we talked about that about having a password manager right doesn't that make sense doesn't that make a whole lot of sense you need a password manager in order to keep track of your passwords in order to be able to generate good passwords, right? Because you want different ones for different accounts. My password manager, of course, the one that I like, is called OnePassword.com. And that particular password manager has some great features for businesses, for sharing passwords, for doing all of this sort of stuff. But um, Norton, just think about that. Your password manager, I have over 2,000 records in my password manager. Most of those are account uh, information. Yeah, websites with different usernames, different passwords. So uh, Gen Digital, this is the company that used to be known as Symantec Corporation. Remember them? Symantec, who puts together some of this antivirus software, right? That's really going to protect you because, uh, you know, Symantec, Norton. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. And then, then one of their head sales guys at the company got fired because he said, yeah, our software doesn't do anything. It isn't worth anything anymore because things have just changed so much, right? Yeah, so um, Symantec bought Norton, bought LifeLock, right? So now you got Norton LifeLock, and, and their ad is all about keeping your information safe online, right? That if your identity is stolen, they're going to help you get it back. Remember, initially it was, we have a million-dollar insurance policy. Uh, yeah, well, the policy, the million dollars wasn't to protect you, it turns out that the million dollars was to protect them. They're, they're saying, hey, listen, if our systems go down, 
then we have a million dollar insurance policy because our systems went down, right? It's just misleading after misleading after misleading. Who are these people? Politicians, right? No, no, they're just marketers. Well, if, they, that's, if you ask me, this proves that they're just monitor, just marketers, right? Because this data breach notification that went out to the customers of Norton LifeLock told them the customers that hackers have successfully breached Norton password manager accounts. They're using what are called credential stuffing attacks. In other words, your data had been stolen and that included your username and password somewhere else. And then they tried to use that username and password, that email address and password that they had stolen elsewhere to get into Norton. And apparently it worked. Yeah. So this is an article in Bleeping Computer. It's in my newsletter this week. Uh, according to a letter sample shared with the Office of Vermont Attorney General, the attacks did not result from a breach on the company, but from a count prompt compromise on other platforms. So in other words, the bad guys got usernames, got email accounts which are usually what are used for usernames which is why i don't like the idea of your email being your username on the on a website and passwords from elsewhere and then what do they do what's credential stuffing well that's where the bad guys take that list of email addresses and passwords and try every one of them on a website like norton lifelock and then guess what happens when they get in (laughs) <laughs> they're in right and a company like norton lifelock you'd think would have in place systems that detect this sort of thing saying wait a minute we are getting an inordinate number of attempted logins uh and that could be a problem right does that make sense to you yeah, well, more specifically, this notice explains that around December 1st, 2022, an attacker used username and password pairs they bought from the dark web to attempt to log into Norton customer accounts. Norton detected an unusually large volume of failed login attempts on December 12th, more than a week later, indicating credential stuffing attacks where threat actors try out credentials in bulk. This sort of stuff should just be picked up instantly. Instantly, you know, a matter of minutes. Wait a minute now, what's going on here? By December 22nd, the company had completed its internal investigation, which revealed that the credential stuffing attacks had successfully compromised an undisclosed number of customer accounts. Yeah, so for customers who use the Norton Password Manager feature... The notice warns that the attackers might have obtained details stored in private vaults. <laughs> it's, I, I have to chuckle. It's so sad. Right? Think about what happened with LastPass. How many people? I know there are some of you who used LastPass, which was also recently breached for the second time in what, a year or two years? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the private vaults and and onepassword.com has those as well are where you have information you want to keep confidential. Might be anything from purchase orders through small documents. You don't want to put big documents in into your vaults. You want to put the key that you use to encrypt those big documents into vaults. But um, you know, that's what those private vaults are. So who knows what was in there? So, as it says, depending on what users store in their accounts, this could lead to the compromise of other online accounts, loss of digital assets, exposure of secrets, and more. Well, let me see. What are some of the digital assets people might have stored into their wonderful Norton password manager? Hmm. Might it be things like uh, cryptocurrency wallet keys and passwords? So if you've been using Norton, particularly, you know, their password manager, you might want to double check your bank account balances and your crypto account balances, right? 
Now, Norton LifeLock underlines that the risk is especially large for those who use similar Norton account passwords and password manager keys, allowing the attackers to pivot more easily. <laughs> this is, again, bleepingcomputer.com. It's in my newsletter this week, craigpeterson.com. The company says it has reset Norton passwords on impacted accounts to prevent attackers from gaining access to them again in the future and also implemented additional measures to counter the malicious attempts. So what are some of the things you can do to help prevent credential stuffing attacks? Well, first off, if you are considering, um, you know, using a website, look at something called 2FA. Because what happens, uh, what happens is the bad guys might have your email, might have your username, might have your password, but when you try and log in, hopefully something like Duo alerts you and says, hey, is this really you? And the site says, give me a six-character password. Make sense to you? So use two-factor authentication, and it is built in to OnePassword.com. Check it out online. I meant to get to this a little earlier, but uh, you got to know about this because millions of vehicles are at risk. There have been some major vulnerabilities discovered in 16 major car brands. Wow. Well, there's some research that was done last year. A guy named Sam Curry over at Yuga Labs showed some pretty detailed security flaws in a connected vehicle service provided by Sirius XM. You know those guys, right? That could particularly put cars at risk of remote attacks. It is a bad thing. Thing. And you might remember a couple of years ago where something similar happened where a car had been hacked by a guy who, hey, this was known in advance, this was all prearranged, but a guy had said, hey, listen, I can control your car and hack in through the entertainment system. So he put a USB drive in, a thumb drive into the computer, which is the entertainment system. And from there, he was able to remote control the car. How's that for something? Well, the most serious of the issues, according to the hackernews.com that Sam Curry found, could have been exploited to get full administrative access to the cars. This means a bad guy could issue any commands it wanted to about 15 and a half million vehicles and not only those commands but they could upload new device firmware and that's the firmware that runs your car remember nowadays our cars have this centralized system they have something called can bus that allows all of the little things on the car to be able to talk to each other back and forth and have a good old time right well the researchers were saying that this would have allowed them to track and shut off starters for police cars, ambulances, law enforcement, for a number of different large cities, and dispatch commands to the vehicles to do all kinds of nasty stuff. In the case of that reporter that was doing the investigation, could even drive him off the road. Now, According again to the Hacker News article, vulnerabilities were identified in Mercedes-Benz that could grant access to internal applications using what's called a single sign-on authentication scheme, which is all of the rage nowadays. There's a lot of stuff you can do with SSOs with single sign-ons. But others would also permit user account takeover, disclosure, disclosure of sensitive information, and it isn't just Mercedes. Other flaws make it possible to access, modify customer records, internal dealer portals, track vehicle GPS locations in real time, manage the license plate data for all Reviver customers, and even update vehicle statuses as stolen. Now, for those that are unfamiliar with it, California now has electronic tags, licenses for cars, not all of them, 
but you can get them. That's what this Reviver thing is all about. So you can have your own extremely personalized license plate. Now, it still has to be issued by the state. It still has a license plate number, but you can put other stuff on your license plate, right? Uh, have a happy day, whatever you want to stick on that license plate. I'm, I'm sure within limits, right? Because most of these states do kind of say you can't say certain things on your license plates. But anyways, so if an attacker use those vulnerabilities in what are called API endpoints or application program interface endpoints that these vehicle telematic systems are using, they could do simple things too. They could honk the horn, flash the lights, remotely track, lock on lock, stop start vehicles completely remotely. Now, we're getting more and more interconnected vehicles. Many of our cars nowadays, you, you hook up to the Wi-Fi at your house. I was driving my son's pickup truck a couple of weeks ago, and I noticed it was trying to connect to Wi-Fi. And his pickup truck's a few years old. So the car is doing what? Well, it's going to Wi-Fi to do two things, download or upload, right? And in the case of most of these new vehicles, it downloads new firmware. It gets information about what features you've paid for, which features have expired. So your seat heater won't work anymore. Remember we talked about that, that they want to charge you five bucks a month to use the seat heater that you paid for in the car or 15 bucks a month to have remote start using the app on your phone, which uses what? It uses these APIs that are so problematic so there's been an increase of 225 percent in the last three years in connecting to cars car hacking isn't that something and almost all of these attacks happen remotely it's not like the days where you had someone in a parking lot and they were grabbing the code that your little remote door lock and unlock and starter generates you remember those? Those are pretty common. Now they can do almost all of this remotely. And the technology of our cars isn't going to get simpler. There's not going to have fewer computers on board. I heard a stat this week on this one car in particular it had 3,000 intelligent devices on board, little tiny computers doing different things. That's a very, very scary to me. So it gets more complex the more these things they add the more self-driving features think about self-driving for a minute it can turn your steering wheel the computer can it can hit your brakes it can hit your accelerator so what happens if that car's hacked what happens if the software fails hopefully it's nothing critical right but there are the car companies up to snuff when it comes to keeping the cars secure that's really the big question here and i guess we'll see we'll see what ends up happening so that's it for our friendly neighborhood conversation about <laughs> the cars and apis but we're talking about all of them out there really acura bmw ferrari ford genesis honda hyundai infinity jaguar kia land rover mercedes-benz nissan porsche rolls royce toyota and others including software from reviver that we mentioned sirius xm and spirion so it's pretty scary uh, I don't know. The more I see this sort of stuff, the more I want to just drive around a 1980 Mercedes-Benz diesel, right? Rather than have all of that uh, risk out there. Hey, I want to mention, if you have a Windows computer, uh, listen up right now. The Windows 10 is going to be around for a little while still. Windows 11, of course, is the latest release. However, Windows 7 Professional and Enterprise Editions, Windows 7, is now no longer receiving the extended security updates for critical important vulnerabilities, okay? So here, here's how that works. You've got the professional, you've got the enterprise, you've got the long-term support versions. They tend to have support for 
these types of security problems for a good six years. The regular desktop versions do not. Okay, uh, They instituted this extended security update program at Microsoft as kind of a last resort option for customers who still needed to run, the, run these legacy Microsoft programs past end of support. But, okay, Windows 7, it's over. And Windows 8.1, believe it or not, that launched nine years ago, is also now out of support. No more security updates for you. All right. So make sure you upgrade, and I'm using that term loosely, to Windows 10 or Windows 11. And uh, be safe out there. Okay. And get the newsletter. I got links to all of this stuff. It's free, Craig Peterson. Dot com. I think there's very little more important than CVEs than these common vulnerability and exposures. And I want to talk about Microsoft right now. In Windows 11, Microsoft is doing a lot to stop some of these vulnerabilities. We're seeing tens of thousands of vulnerabilities in software, and we tend to really focus in on, well, the big ones and the big vendors. And Microsoft, of course, is a very big vendor when it comes to most of the personal computers out there that are used in businesses and that are used in homes. And so is Apple, obviously. Linux is very big, too. Linux owns the server market, no question about that one. But Microsoft... Microsoft, because it has been so terrible when it comes to these critical vulnerabilities, that they've pulled up their socks. I got to say, since Bill Gates left and Steve Ballmer, those two guys, oh man, they did no one any favors. And we could talk about that for hours and hours. Uh, the new guy in there has been amazing. They have really focused in on how to serve people and businesses in a very good way. They've added all kinds of functionality that should have been added years before it was added. They're now running on all kinds of platforms. Even some of the Microsoft software runs on Linux, and now Linux runs on Windows. Man, who would have thought that would ever happen? I remember when Microsoft bought one of the leading Unixes out there. What was that? Xenix, I think it was. And they shot it in the head, which is something Microsoft has done many, many times, right? Uh, we don't like the competition, so we will buy them and then we'll just let them dwindle away to nothing. Well, it has really changed because this whole support for Linux came, at least as far as I'm concerned, for left field. See, what Microsoft has done over the years is they've taken some of the technology, some of the methodologies from other companies and uh, that have been working really well and completely perverted them. So they're not compatible with anybody, right? You have to be Microsoft compatible. Thank goodness they started losing that war in a big way when it came to Microsoft. Microsoft Internet Explorer, because so many companies were designing their software so that it worked with Internet Explorer. They never bothered checking anything else. And Microsoft was effectively pushing some of these other companies out of the market entirely. And of course, Microsoft lost some legal cases here in the US over that whole thing, integrating Windows Explorer into the operating system itself. Now, Windows Explorer, you might know it better as Windows Explorer. Exploder. And then, then they tried the same thing with their latest, wonderful, most beautiful browser in the world and found out that that didn't work either. People were not following the Microsoft standards anymore and were following industry standards, were following Google and what they were doing. So the Edge browser, even though it was still named Edge, even though it still had the same wonderful logo, was actually Google under the hood. They had to change it again. 
so that they could be compatible. So it's got a Chromium uh, engine underneath it designed by Google. And even Chrome has underneath all of that WebKit designed by Apple. You see, the whole industry has changed in so many ways because of open source. Unix has had what's called a shell or command line interface for decades since it came out in really the 70s. And that's when I started using it. And Microsoft said, oh, we've got to do that. We've got to do that. So they came up with PowerShell, which is absolutely horrific. Rather than use the open source standards that were already out there that they could have used and they could have distributed with their operating system. No, 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 no. They had to write their own. But that not invented here syndrome has changed. Thank goodness. And even Google has seen some of that. They just lost an appeal. Google did, by the way, over in the European Union and has find a record record four billion dollars isn't that something it's 4.1 billion euros uh, that's quite a penalty over there and this was over the android mobile operating system and that google was playing the microsoft games that it was using its android mobile operating system to lock rivals out of the market and google had appealed it and europe's second highest court ended up upholding it isn't that something and then also a judge just allowed a lawsuit to move forward against Google that was brought by 16 states and territories here in the U.S. over the Google advertising technology. I actually kind of expect Google to lose that case as well. So Microsoft has pulled up its socks. It's got a little smarter. It's playing more of the open source game, open standards game. It has even released some of its software into the open source community, basically the public domain. Isn't that something? Well, Windows 11 has been a headache for so many people because it requires something called a TPM chip, this trusted platform module. Now, we have recommended to all of our customers when they bought new computers for the last few years to buy them with a TPM chip in it. Now, in some computers, that chip is just something very simple. It, you can buy it after the fact. Most of the motherboards already have that availability for the chip right in there. So all you have to do is you pay your bucks and they ship it to you and plug it in. So if you've been having trouble upgrading to Windows 11, and it is an upgrade, okay? I, I've many times in the past argued that some of the Microsoft Windows releases were not upgrades, but it is an upgrade. And this TPM 2.0 chip is well worth it. Now, Microsoft hasn't really done much with it. It's not like the Apple T2 chip that's been in Apple computers for years now that really is a great piece of hardware security. The TPM hasn't been. But here's what's happening. We're seeing some major upgrades again from Microsoft. Who would have thought Microsoft? Well, they're bringing zero trust to the hardware with windows 11 it's not quite out it's going to be out soon keep an eye out for it but here's what's happening network level security is mandatory but it's really not good enough to protect against attackers who are targeting a computer's firmware and other low level if you will elements inside the computer so think about the boot roms right Many computers don't have a boot ROM anymore. There's a UEFI, so they, they boot up. Yeah, of course, there's something there in some sort of a ROM, but it's not the BIOS like we're used to. And then it'll boot off of a file system that might be in read-only memory. It might be on the disk, etc. All of that stuff has been infected as of late. The bad guys have gotten their hands, their fingers into that and caused all kinds of problems. So what's going to happen is Microsoft, again, is going to copy other people. And in this case, it's going to copy Apple. Microsoft is going to use this TPM chip that you had to have now to store sensitive data including multiple cryptographic keys, user credentials, completely isolated from the operating system with a separate secure area 
inside that TPM 2.0 chip. So on the T2, for instance, on an Apple computer, when you boot it up, if you have hardware encryption turned on for the, the disk that's inside, what it'll do is it will come part way up and then it'll have you log in. And all of that information about your login is stored in that secure area of the hardware. And it's a secure area so that nothing can get in there. It's very, very, very hard. No one's been able to break into it yet. Well, there's, there's one case, but it's kind of an edge condition. And what they've been able to do with this now is really totally lock down the Apple computers for years. So now... Microsoft is going to use some of those same techniques now to introduce these new security measures, which is fantastic. That's where you want the sensitive data. You want it encrypted inside a hardware module that cannot be broken into. For instance, if you have an iPhone, have you you're taken it in? and had the screen replaced by one of these mall guys, right? That, yeah, we fix iPhones. And have you noticed that sometimes, or you might have heard this from your friends too, the, the uh, facial recognition no longer works. In fact, the phone won't work anymore because when they're removing that screen, if they don't do it the right way, right tools, then that particular, that screen is going to cause some minor damage to that T2 chip in there, that trusted platform chip, and it will no longer work, that iPhone. So if you're going to have the screen replaced, by the way, make sure you take it to Apple. They're not expensive. And Apple just made a change in their Apple Care. If you get Apple Care Plus, I know this is a side note, but if you have an iPhone, if you have Apple Care Plus and you cause any damage to the phone by anything, accidental damage, dropping it, uh, scratching it in your pocket, whatever it might be, they now say that for an unlimited number of times a year, they will fix it for you. Wow. How's that, eh? I love it. So now there's also some application control enhancements coming to windows 11 they're using again this chip and some more advanced security in the kernel of windows to give some application controls now vulnerable driver protection enhanced identity protection simplified password management and even more microsoft is even adding a series of functions that it calls smart app control so that's going to provide you with a much tighter level of security even when you are choosing which applications you want to run think of this as again microsoft ripping off apple and how apple is running these programs inside basically isolated containers and expect a lot more of this in the future as containerization improves so this feature this new one is using artificial intelligence they got a database of 43 trillion security signals that are gathered by microsoft is to help prevent scripting attacks using their Yes, they're lousy uh, scripting language. Um, and also, um, it's going to protect you from running untrusted or unsigned applications. Again, rip off from Apple. But good news if you are a Windows user. Make sure you get my newsletter, craigpeterson.com. Keep up to date and follow those CVEs. You need to know about vulnerabilities if you're going to fix them. I'm quite sure I have bought more things on Amazon than any other website out there. But I've noticed some big changes. And this week, Jeff Bezos' other company, The Washington Post, uh, they noticed as well. And so should you. Hey, it turns out our imagination isn't running wild. The shopping on Amazon has gotten worse. And uh, as the headline says here on the Washington Post, no, no, not the democracy dies in darkness because they obviously don't believe that. But on this particular article is everything on Amazon is becoming an ad. 
So I, I look at that and say, wait a minute, th- this is owned by Jeff Bezos. He's the founder of Amazon. Of course, he's not the owner because it's a public company. They had a lot of investment money. They went, what, more than a decade, I think, without making a single dime in profit. So they relied pretty heavily on investors. But is this a accidental journalism uh, over there in the Washington Post? Or wh- what do you think is going on? Because this article is really nailing Amazon, and I think in a good way, too. And that's why I want to talk about it today. I have bought, as I said, a whole lot of things. I have a business account on Amazon. I have a personal account on Amazon. We do a lot of shopping there. We've started to do a little bit more shopping on Walmart.com as well. Target has their online store and it's probably worth checking out i haven't bothered their prices you know they're pretty competitive over there but i i'm just used to walmart it's close to my house and it's easy to go pick up so let's talk about shopping and where you should go online what you should be a little bit concerned about one of the big things of course when it comes to online shopping is making sure our money isn't stolen Ten years ago, that used to be a very big deal. Hey, I, I'm not saying that your money can't be stolen online anymore. But why it's not such a big deal is you're shopping online. You're using a credit card, most likely. In fact, that's why I got a credit card. Before that, I'd only used debit cards and cash and checks. But I got one. And the reason is every major credit card company out there covers you. If your credit card number is stolen, if it's misused, you can just get it shut down. You can have the payment, uh, not not payment, but the, the bill reversed. So it shows up on your statement and you say, wait a minute, uh, I didn't buy that Louis Vuitton bag. And you dispute it and you can dispute it with the, the store you supposedly bought it from. Or you can just call up the credit card company. Ta-da, you're not out anything other than obviously a little bit of time. But it's not like a debit card where that money comes directly out of of your bank account instantly to pay for that Louis Vuitton bag that you didn't buy. So the credit card companies have made it so much easier to shop online. And and you'd kind of expect them to, wouldn't you? Because what are they doing? They're making money online. And the more people buy online, the more with credit cards, the more credit card companies make. So I'm, you know, I'm all for that. I understand that. So you're, you're much safer than you used to be as far as spending online goes. Your email address, your password, well, those have likely been stolen over the course of years. We've talked about that before here on the show and how you can find out if it's been stolen, where it was stolen. But I, I'm not going to talk about your passwords, and what you should do and how to keep track of them today. We've talked about that before, and we'll talk about it again. And if you're interested, we do have a password special report that you can get by just going to craigpeterson.com slash subscribe and uh, get on the newsletter because I'm pretty sure I still send that out. I have a little automated sequence for that. When you sign up, you'll get that password special report. You can just email me, me at craigpeterson.com and I will make sure you get a copy. of. You have to ask me, right? Because I get an email and it doesn't say anything. I have no idea what's going on. So say you want the password thing. Anyhow, Back to online shopping. The other thing about Amazon is it's not necessarily the best price out there. As a rule, their prices aren't bad. They certainly strong arm some of their sellers. And we're going to get into some of those strong arm tactics that really hurt small businesses. But as a rule, the prices aren't too bad. So what WAPO did, the Washington Post, is they went online to Amazon And they did a couple of searches and they compared the results from 2015 to results from today to get an idea. So they did a search for cat beds. So they've got a screenshot of it here in the article and it was in the newsletter. You should have seen it in there. But this is showing the first page of results. And there are six results here on the first page. Now, remember, looking for cat beds. 
Well, they've got this bod- bodescient uh, brand, which uh, my understanding is that is an Amazon brand. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they have also on here uh, cat beds, right? We're looking for cat beds to dogs in beds. Now, years ago, Amazon search engine was wonderful, and it would give you exactly what you're looking for. You could do a comparison, decide what you wanted, what was the best thing for you. And of course, you can still do that to a degree. But what they are now doing is taking sponsored results. And so they're, they're showing it with they've got an orange highlight on top of all the results that are sponsored. In other words, this first page of results, there's six results, and they're pretty big, so that's why it is taking up a full page, are paid for advertisements by the company that's selling them. No, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with a paid advertisement. It would be nice if the ad matched what you're looking for. You know, uh, cat beds, don't show me a dog, an an Amazon Basics cooling elevated pet bed. I I don't know cats that would actually like that. I know dogs that would. And this this soft plush round bed that's showing a picture of a a dog, right? It's just kind of crazy. They got a cat tree, which is neat and places on that tree for them to sleep so there's an ad for this bodicient at the top and there are three results that paid their way to the top of the cat beds listing and they're not all relevant and one of these is a luxury cat condo i guess is what you might call it that costs a mere 389 dollars that's a cat tree that I was talking about, right? So scrolling down to the second screen, the very first result is yet another ad. And we're finally starting to see non-ads. And what's interesting here is these ads, when they're showing a pet, they are cats. And then you go down a little bit further here, and uh, guess what? We're back to some of these promoted, these sponsored ads. So what you're looking for on Amazon is the small word that says sponsored. Sometimes it's in the ads. So I'm looking at a screenshot here, again, from that article that was in the newsletter from the Washington Post, that's showing sponsored based on star rating and number of customer ratings. Now, it's kind of small. It's at the top. So we've become used to seeing sponsored in the text of the ad, either in the bottom right-hand corner of the ad or maybe up above the banner for the ad. In this case, no, no. It is above all three of them. Just it's one line above the three different listings. You see how they're getting tricky? And so now you go to the next. So first page, all ads. Second page, one fifth of them are ads. The third page, and it's all ads again. So there's also an interesting little label here, which is highly rated. But don't be fooled by that, because in fact, these are not the highest rated cat beds on Amazon. Again, they are just ads. Isn't that amazing? So you scroll again, the screen has even more ads. So half of the listings on this next page, page number four, are ads again. And it's really, again, really tricky because instead of saying sponsored, as we talked about before in each ad, or even sponsored on the top of the page above the ads. This time it's saying Amazon's private and select exclusive brands. Again, it's an ad, right? So it's not based on what you might want as much or or how well rated it is, as much as it is who's going to pay us to place their product on the page. We're not used to this with Amazon. With Amazon, yeah, we're not so much the product, are we? Because we're paying for something. It's not like Facebook where, hey, it's free. Well, yeah, and we're the product, which means it's not exactly free. You're selling our information. You're promoting stuff to us. 
on Amazon, we kind of expected a little bit different treatment because we are paying Amazon. Now, we're going to cover this some more here, so don't go anywhere. But these top-rated band brands have something in common that we're going to talk about. Make sure you get my newsletter, by the way. Uh, this was in the newsletter. We have all kinds of great stuff in there, more information for you. But you got to be on the newsletter. It's absolutely free. And I'm not just pounding you with ads, right? I'm not Amazon. Just go to craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. And if you have any notes on the radio show or the podcast or any of the other stuff I do, I'd love to hear from you. What should I cover? Just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. We've long known that if it's free, you are the product, right? Facebook, Twitter, think of all of those guys. And now we're finding out that Amazon has kind of changed their strategy to our detriment. Amazon used to be a place you could go online, find good deals. Well, way back when on books, right? Now it's on almost anything and feel comfortable with that purchase. But a lot of things have changed. Amazon is now a minor seller on its own platform. Amazon doesn't make the stuff they're selling, obviously, and they also are making other people pay to keep inventory in Amazon's warehouses. In fact, what's happened here is Amazon has become a fulfillment company. It's become an advertising arm, in fact, for many of these you know, vendors, really, manufacturers, etc., some of these are Chinese firms, some of them are U.S. firms, some people are in the U.S. but are taking their products, having them made in China or elsewhere and selling them on Amazon. There have been some pretty big lawsuits against Amazon for damage caused by products sold by Amazon. Although Amazon didn't source it, they said we we're just act acting as a fulfillment house. Some pretty interesting cases if you're an attorney and you want to look into it a little bit more. It's uh, really something to see what they've been doing. But we've been going through some of these listings on Amazon. This is based on an article from the Washington Post and we're talking about cat beds in this particular case here. So we've looked through the first five pages of results and we found some interesting things and we got a bunch more to go after here just to help you guys understand shopping online. Most of us do. Most Americans not only do shopping online, but we're buying online, which is another change. It used to be people did the research online, then they went to brick and mortar store to check it out and buy it. Nowadays, the majority of people are using their smartphones, they're going online, they're buying there and having it shipped directly to them. Interesting stuff, eh? So under the next page of results, it's saying top rated from our brands. And uh, yet, again, these are all sponsored. We've got another dog photo, right? It, it just keeps going on and on. And if you keep on scrolling, the ads keep coming and sometimes they're repeats i know you've probably noticed that right on uh, tv radio with the internet uh, some of these ads just keep on coming so of these first five screens more than 50 percent of the space was dedicated to ads and amazon touting its own products so i, I want to talk about its own products here for a little bit because i have been harmed by this sort of thing, not by Amazon, uh, but by this sort of thing, as many people I know have been. You see, what Amazon has been accused of doing is going, uh, you know, on its little way, people sign up, they have their little business, right? Mom and pop, you worked really hard, you, you paid $100,000 to have dyes made so that you can injection mold things and you worked out a lot of the kinks and, you know, the house is all mortgaged and you start selling it and how do I get real distribution? Well, let's just do it over on Amazon. So off you go. You're over on Amazon. Yay. Yay you. 
And Amazon notices, hey, wait a minute now, this little gadget is selling really, really well. In fact, look at, they've got a few different models of that gadget. And then they are accused of doing the same thing Microsoft has been doing. When Microsoft notices something selling pretty well, they go ahead and make their own product to compete with mom and pop that made the gadget that put their life and their livelihood their retirement into it and now all of a sudden we've got an amazon brand competing against them now i i gotta say here too in all fairness anybody can go online to amazon and figure out what's selling well and then source it in China or somewhere else and compete directly against them. So it's not as though Amazon is the big evil mean company out there and the only one doing this sort of thing. I interviewed a guy on my show a few years back and he goes out to the consumer electronics show. He was so proud telling me this and I was sitting there saying, my gosh, I can't believe you'd actually admit to this. But the consumer electronics show is in lost wages, Nevada every every january uh, they they had a bit of a hiatus and did things remotely i used to go every year and record interviews there but you know, i'm not so much into that sort of thing so i haven't done it for a couple of years and what ends up happening well people are going there to what to show their wares usually they're very small companies there's the big guys are there too you've got adobe and <laughs> microsoft and some of these others that have these huge booths of course you you'll see sony there and viazio and all of these big consumer brand names uh, remember gold star now called lg's there uh, it just goes on and on but there are whole major sections of the consumer electronic show that are dedicated to startups to mom and pop things where they've got this great idea for a great little widget and they bring it there and show it there so this guy was bragging to me about how he goes to ces every year and he talks to these people and finds stuff that he likes. Oh, that's a cool little speaker. That sounds really good. Hey, um, you know, I've got some retail stores. Can you send me a sample so I can check it out? You know, I don't want to carry it around the show, which a lot of people say, which I say, right? I don't, I don't want to carry it around. So they send him a free sample, which is reasonable, right? They're hoping to make some sales, retail store. Man, that's exactly what we're looking for, retail electronics stores. So they send it to him. And so he's, he's bragging to me about all of this and saying, well, so then what I do is I, if I play with it a little bit. And if I like it, I ship it off to my buddy in China and have it made for cheap. And then I start selling them with my own brand name on it. That's what he does. And it isn't just one product. It's multiple products. Like lots of them. His store was full of these types of products. A real problem, if you ask me. That's just so underhanded. I think it's unethical. So all of these people who were at the Consumer Electronics Show that paid their way probably spent twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 just to be at the show with their crew, with the space rental. You know, you got to pay for the carpet. You know what it's like at these trade shows. It gets very expensive very fast. And... What happens? Well, before they can even start up the manufacturing in China, you know, to mass produce these things, this guy has already got it made, you know, reverse engineered, made, and then he's selling it. it it's a terrible, terrible thing. So I was talking about Amazon when it comes to this. I don't like this, but it's pretty common. And I know uh, one guy anyways, who's selling a course on how to do this, how to find something popular on Amazon or on one of these funding sites that are out there and then take that idea and run with it. So we're going to talk about how you can avoid this a little bit more when you are online shopping and how you can tell, are those reviews legitimate? I'm going to tell you what some of these underhanded companies are doing to make 
their products look like they're worth buying, even though they might not be. Man, the unethical stuff that's been happening. What's coming on? What's going on with this world, right? I, I just don't know. All right, so stick around. Make sure you sign up for my newsletter. There's so much great stuff. We're approaching 10,000 subscribers right now. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. You'll find out everything you need to know from patches, how to apply them, which ones you even have to worry about through stuff like this every week. CraigPeterson.com. You've probably shopped online at Amazon, maybe Walmart, Home Depot, and Target. They all have great offers online. Their sites are pretty easy to use, but there are a lot of sneaky ads as well. So when you have the results, we know to look for sponsored. We know to look for house brands. And a lot of the brands that Amazon has are actually house brands. In other words, it's it's their own contracts with manufacturers that are making them for Amazon. So, so some of the stuff even sounds pretty cool, like it's some fancy French designer or something. In reality, it's just some Amazon guys. But how can we know which of the reviews are legit and which reviews are not? And where the ads are. Now, there was a comparison done. And again, this is on the WashingtonPost.com website. A, a comparison done between Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, and Target. And they looked at the average number of sponsored results on the first page of product search queries. And what they found was Amazon has the most. So the first page, on average, it had 8.5 sponsored results. Next worse was Walmart. And they've gotten quite a bit worse over the last two years, by the way. Amazon's gotten a little bit better. So since October 2020 or so. So Walmart has about four ads in the first page of results. And then way down... Home Depot and Target both have less than two ads on the first page of results. So that tells you a little bit of something here. Amazon is definitely becoming a advertising platform for people. Really, you know, much less than, hey, go to Amazon, get the best price, get it quickly. It's, uh, uh, yeah, we'll do that for you. Maybe we'll get you the best price, but uh, probably not. And you'll get it pretty quickly, but, you know, we don't have next day as much as we used to have. Oh, and, uh, yeah, we're making a lot of money by charging people to have their products featured on the first pages of results, which is pretty interesting when you get right down to it. So what can you trust now? Let's say that you've got the shill results in front of you, but it's hard to tell. It's easy to tell if you can read the word sponsored, right? Or you can read that it's an, an Amazon brand. But how about if you're looking at something? By the way, Amazon made $31 billion in ads last year. It's now the third largest online ad company in the United States trailing only Google and Facebook. Remember Google and Facebook, you are the product. They're selling you, they're selling your information. Well, Amazon's doing the same thing. It's just incredible. So Amazon insists they're actually doing a good thing for us. They've got a quote here again in the Washington Post. We are dedicated to providing customers with a world-class shopping experience, including working hard every day to ensure the ads they see are useful, informative, and help make shopping a little bit easier, said a spokesman by the name of Patrick Graham, or Graham, or however he might pronounce it. So let's see here. Uh, let's talk about spotting the fake reviews. So you look at that review and you'll see that product there with stars, right? And usually it's like four and a half stars. Sometimes it's only four stars. Have you ever noticed that, by the way? You don't really see too many one star things in there. 
Well, part of the problem are fake reviews, because if you're shopping on Amazon, there's a very good chance you'll see fake reviews. So if you read them, and this is how you can tell where they're legit, legit. first of all, are there a lot of them? If there's 10,000 reviews at four and a half stars, they're probably mostly legitimate. If there's a couple hundred reviews, yeah, that could be a problem. So reading them, you might notice that it is kind of suspiciously glowing term description. You might find that it doesn't really describe the item, just like these ads we were talking about for cat beds where it's showing pictures of dogs, right? Uh, and so it'll be generic. I found these before of, of yeah, my, oh, my family uses this product every day and it's been the best product we've ever had. It, they don't mention the product name. Uh, they don't mention the actual use of it or that the kitty cat likes the cat bed. Those are very suspicious. So they're, these short five-star reviews are intended to game the system because they're trying to boost a product's ranking and visibility. So what some of these companies have been doing is they hire people to buy the product from Amazon and then give it a five-star rating. So let's say the product is a, usually these are the cheaper products. Let's say it's a five or $10 product on Amazon. So they'll send them 20 bucks and have the person buy the product and then give the product a good rating. Yeah, that there's, that's actually an industry, believe it or not. But there's also some more subtle attempts to get you to try, try and get you to buy here. But sometimes paid reviewers will go into some detail, maybe they'll share photos, and even include a con alongside many of the pros for the product, because that's something that most of us look for. When I'm looking at those star ratings, I look at the top ones, but I also look at the worst ones. I want to see what the one stars are, because that's going to tell me, well, wait a minute now, this uh, this doesn't look legit, or yeah, you know, that gave them a one star, and that's exactly what I planned on using a product for, right? For a legitimate review. So they might score the product four out of five stars, just to make it a little more convincing. They also very frequently have very poor English grammar. Now, you know, that's a tough one because there's a lot of people that don't have great grammar, but you know what? It's pretty common to see very, very bad grammar in some of these paid reviews. I, I've also I, I had an occasion where I bought one of these handheld massagers and in the box was a card right at the very top that said, hey, give us a review on Amazon and we'll send you an extra battery. And I immediately had alarms going off in my head that this was obviously just trying to get me to review it or other people to review it. And I said, oh, what the heck? Let's try it. So I went online and I gave it an honest review. I did not like how it rattled and it was pretty loud. I ended up buying a different a massager that was way, way better. But it rattled and it was pretty loud. I didn't really like it very much. I think I gave it three stars. It did the job of massaging quite well. But what it didn't do very well at all was um, be comfortable and pleasant to use, which you kind of hope, right, when you're buying a product. So that's another thing they're doing. They will. Uh, so I, anyways, I, I had given the review. I sent it in to them just to see what would happen. And uh, no surprise, of course, never heard from them. And I never got my free battery. Right. So um, there are legitimate reviews that are out online. Uh, some of the media has great reviews. There are counterfeit items that are out there, and that's a whole other problem. But um, you can find legitimate reviews online. Look at sites out there. Wired is an example. There was, a, in fact, I'm not going to mention this media outlet's name, but a major media outlet that I, if you follow tech at all, you have been on their website that was selling reviews. Yeah, for consumer products. It, it was just crazy because I used to rely on them a little bit. And of course, until I found out what was really going on behind the scenes, major media. So 
buyer beware, right? Isn't that the bottom line? Hey, if you have any questions, just email me at craigpeterson.com or suggestions about things you'd like to hear me talk about, craigpeterson.com. Just me, M-E, at craigpeterson.com. Oh, did I mention it was craigpeterson.com? We've been talking a lot about Amazon and buying online, how to spot scams, etc. There is a website that I want to talk about here that is designed to do exactly that. Spot fake ads and maybe even get you a bit of a better deal. I was uh, just listening to a song by Glenn Campbell and a Wichita lineman and it reminded me of when I was younger but uh, it also reminded me of these poor guys and gals that have to go out and fix our power so hats off to all of them right our power goes out from wind storms or ice storms man we remember that one a decade or so ago nasty ice storm hit northern mass and southern new hampshire but uh, man there are so many unsung heroes out there it just it never ends and you know you name it the water guys power people the all of the of course first responders i was a volunteer first responder for more than a decade and as was my wife we both did ems stuff which was kind of cool back in the day the early days kind of reminded me of emergency if you remember that show from the 70s and we had some special dispensation for giving drugs and doing all kinds of different procedures out in the field so it was it was pretty cool and it was an honor to serve everybody so i just well i'm thinking about it right now because we had a power failure at our place last night uh you know just hats off to all of the people that are out there making our lives a whole lot easier let me tell you now we're buying things online that's established we're using amazon they are the biggest out there right now for selling stuff they're the the third largest search engine in the country i mentioned that earlier but how do you know if an ad is fake or not well there is an extension for google chrome now let me first of all give you a little bit of word of warning some of you have attended my webinars where i've talked about some of the extensions which ones you might want to use which ones you might not want to use to me it's very revealing because one of the extensions that i recommended people use saves your tabs if you're not using them what it does is it frees up the memory from the tab takes a screenshot first and just shows the screenshot on there it's really it speeds up your computers and saves memory and everything else it's it's really kind of cool but and the reason i'm not telling you the name of that one it was sold the developer had developed it wasn't making money off it wasn't charging for it It was all free isn't that wonderful and then a kind of a bad guy bought it from him and they changed it to be spyware so all of a sudden something that i recommended became spyware now i sent out an email to everybody letting them know that hey uh, you might want to switch over to this particular uh, plugin or extension instead so i'm always leery when it comes to extensions because they can watch what you're doing where you're going apple's got some great little new mechanisms in there for their safari browser that lets you just give an extension access for a day or a week or a website really kind of nice google chrome which i don't use a lot i have to use it sometimes because some websites just don't understand my apple safari browser and if you're using firefox sometimes i don't understand firefox which is another good browser that's out there but the bottom line is if you put an extension on at some point it's going to have access to your stuff and when we're shopping online there's advertisers like honey you've probably heard of them before and i've tried their extension out i got to try these little browser plugins so that i can talk about them and know what they're about but the idea behind that one is as you go on the web and you cruise around and you're on a website that happens to sell something i'll say hey, hey i can get you a better deal and they usually do but they are tracking you they are selling your information they're using that information is that good is that bad well you know what it really depends on you and your opinion about it because it's really neither good nor bad it's not like tiktok 
that is bad. <laughs> no two ways about it. TikTok collecting information on you, using it to manipulate you during uh, election cycles, tracking our kids, and it's TikTok's really bad. So browser extensions are usually not either good or bad. Sometimes they're bad, as I mentioned, because they start stealing your information. So this one, I'm just going to let you know because it looks like it's pretty good, but you're going to want to keep an eye on it. It's called Fake Spot. F A K E S P O T dot com is where you'll find it online. Fake Spot. And this is a site that analyzes the Amazon reviews. So when you're on Amazon, you're on a product page, you can go ahead and say, hey, uh, is this page good or not? You might have to put the URL into it, though, but it pops out a grade. So it'll give you a thing, a letter from A to F to tell you if it thinks the review is legitimate or not. It's using what they call artificial intelligence. Yeah, machine learning is what I would call it. But anyways, it, it takes, takes you to the grade, lets you know what's up. But also, by the way, this is how they make their money. Uh, it has some links to other helpful information like the manufacturer's grade and details and where you might be able to find it at a better price. So they will go ahead now and uh, use their little code on this other website and use that for you to buy the product, right? So that nothing, uh, no skin off your nose, not a big deal. You know, they're going to make a couple of bucks. They got to stay in business, right? I don't know why so many people seem to think that profit is evil. Profit is is how you're paid. That's how the paycheck happens, right? Um, you've got to have profit or you don't have a business. You don't have a service. So if there's too few reviews for a real accurate assessment, fake spot isn't really going to help you out. Or if the reviews are, are really all from a you know, course of a week or two, maybe when a product was first released, then, okay, again, it's still not going to help you out a lot. Brand new products is not going to help you out. But, you know, it, it's really a good thing to have a look at. If you do a lot of shopping online, you're trying to figure out if it's valid or not. Fakespot.com, and you can add it to your Chrome browser. Uh, with Chrome, I don't know if you've noticed, if you add an extension, up at the top right of the screen, there's this little thing. looks like a, a puzzle piece that you can click on up in the toolbar. And it will show you all the extensions that you have and whether or not they're enabled. So I tend to disable them when I am not, uh, when I'm not using a browser extension. FakeSpot does have Facebook pixels on it. I checked that. There's two pixels which means that if you go to that fakespot.com website and then later on you are on Facebook, expect to see some ads from our friends at <laughs> FakeSpot while you're there on Facebook, okay? So, yeah, you, can you trust them? Can you not? It, it's kind of difficult. So there's other sites out there you might want to check out that do independent reviews for some of the different things, but you got to make sure they're legitimate. you got to look for fakes. We've talked about about that already ignore these fake reviews pay attention to the reviews that say verified purchase because that means that whoever did the review did buy it but i explained earlier how that can be thwarted as well by bad guy selling something sending money to people to write reviews who who then use that money to buy it and then keep the change right look at negative reviews because they can often tell you a lot i always go to the negative reviews the one star reviews to see okay what was it people did not like about it and does that matter to me just because somebody wrote a negative review doesn't mean it's a problem for me review dates you're going to look at your ratings distribution all of that sort of stuff and and use external sites to really educate yourself. A lot of information here on shopping online. Some of the red flags that might show a fake campaign review, like there's a high percentage of five-star reviews. Lack of the detail, I talked about that already, like a nice product or awesome or my family uses it every day uh, or my cat loves it and it's a dog bed, right? Uh, mentions of competing products that's something that's interesting because it's not obviously promoting this product it's trying to drive you to another product out there 
wording similar to other reviews that are out there, poor grammar, spelling mistakes, multiple reviews on the same date or dates. And that's particularly a, a red flag if there's been long gaps between the dates of the reviews or, or these clusters of reviews. The customers also bought section contains unrelated products. That tells you a lot right there because that means the Amazon algorithm looked at the comments and looked at the description of the product and is giving you unrelated stuff while some of those reviews might actually be for a different product. I've seen that one before too. Glowing reviews with one small negative that isn't a deal breaker that could be you know a, a problem i mentioned what i had done with that back massager and i gave an honest review it was a good little back massager but man does it make a racket all right so is that going to be viewed by you if you were to see that as a fake review i, I don't think so it's obviously it's not a fake review and also if the reviews are kind of explaining away the cons, right? So the, ultimately, there's no foolproof way to spot fakes because legitimate reviews sometimes have those elements like mine has, but you can always dig deeper. And obviously, it has to do with the price too, right? If you're paying 10 bucks for something, it's not the end of the world, right? If, if it doesn't quite do what you want, Amazon will take it back and you can get something else. And even if they don't take it back, which they usually do, it, it's not, uh, hopefully not going to break your budget. But anyways, it might. You got to be very, very careful. Very careful. All right. Uh, there's another one. I mentioned fake spot. There's one called Review Meta. And that lets you put a URL in to get an analysis and adjusted score. So check that out. And the review index, that tries to identify fake reviews and flag them, but it also offers some, you know, useful summaries. And it puts together different categories of elements of the different products and really helps you with your shopping now as i mentioned before i cannot vouch for all of these that's for sure these things change people buy them but you should have a quick look so review meta i'm on that right now so if i go to my amazon page here's amazon let me just hit on uh, buy it again no i'm gonna connect this deals for me right let's see what they got and I'm on that product. All I have to do is take that URL and stick it right into reviewmeta.com. Hey, all of this was in my newsletter, the free one. If you did not get that newsletter, man, sign up now. We're approaching 10,000 subscribers. Comes out every week and is absolutely free. CraigPeterson.com. <laughs>